Good afternoon, and again, thank you for being here. Um, as Hasna was saying, I uh, have been doing research on contemporary culture and literature in Cuba and Brazil, and I had been working for quite a while on issues of migration and race. And then as I was doing that research, um, issues of violence uh, became very clear in that process, uh, and I discovered this young female writer from Brazil. Uh, so I have started doing work on particularly urban violence in big cities, such as the city of Sao Paulo. The title of uh, this presentation is When the Criminal Speaks because one of the main different characteristics in the writing of Patricia Mello is the fact that she's a female writer, but most of her characters are males. They are criminals, and they speak in the first person. At least you know, in many other literatures, but in the case of Brazil, we were, as readers, we were used to um, literature on crime and violence, uh, but normally they were told in the third person, and normally the narrator would give either a sociological or a psychological interpretation of the criminal mind. In the case of Melo, what we have is the criminal not only describing the crime, but also letting us see inside all the conflictive thoughts and emotions he goes through in the process of becoming an assassin. So for me, the most important element is how she sets up her stories beyond the traditional question of, is the killer mate? You know, does society transform you into a killer, or are you born a killer? And what she does is propose a more complex uh, arena to, I don't know if necessarily understanding, but at least to view urban violence in the context of Brazil from a different perspective. So Brazil is a country that you know, is characterized by the presence of violence throughout history. Um, I'm going to talk about contemporary history because it's uh, the moment in which she places her stories. And we have a military dictatorship between 1964 and 1984. Normally, the dictatorship in Brazil is portrayed as more benevolent than the one in Chile and Argentina. Those are the famous ones in South America. Uh, but actually, um, it was a very repressive regime, and it led to the creation of a series of urban guerrilla movements. Most of them were founded, created by middle class uh, young people who lived in urban areas, uh, most of them students from medical schools and engineering schools. And uh, there is a famous um, novel uh, that was made into this movie you see on the screen. It's called Four Days in September. Um, it's a book written by one of the young men who was part of a guerrilla movement in Sao Paulo called M8. 
uh, and then he became, he is now a politician in, in Brazil. Um, and it is famous because they kidnapped the uh, American ambassador in Brazil at the time. They had him kidnapped for four days, and uh, it ended up being a debacle for the guerrilla people who ended up having to, I mean, in the negotiation, they were able to leave Brazil after being um, taken by the police and tortured. So this is one of the first movies uh, we have depicting uh, urban violence, but related to what was going on during the military dictatorship. In Brazil, in contemporary Brazil, music and literature have been two, um, with um, cinema, the three um, cultural productions that most clearly have proposed uh, these courses and pro productions to resist the violence, whether it is political from the dictatorship or street violence. So we have in the country a tradition of works that denounce social inequalities, lack of opportunities, gender discrimination, political violence. Um, at the same time, we have um, a strong feminist movement that uh, took uh, strong roots in Brazil uh, in the 70s, uh, but has also gone through a complicated process in which uh, issues of class, issues of race, have made it very problematic, uh, particularly uh, black activists in the, what are called favelas, the slums in Brazil, uh, think that um, the well-known feminists in the country uh, are too abstract and theoretical and know nothing about daily life and the struggles they go through. So the movement split due to that. But these are some of the well-known writers um, that portray issues of um, social inequalities in general. And these are all what we consider contemporary writers. As you see, most of them are men. Um, the women we see here, uh, like Raquel de Queiroz and Ligia Fagundes Telles, are writers that focus more on um, gender violence and domestic violence than, in general, uh, street violence. As I said, you know, there is also a long-standing tradition uh, in cinema in portraying this type of uh, violence. And in Brazilian culture, there is a whole very strong and well-known industry to produce, I hesitate to call them soap operas because they are very different to what we have here. In fact, they don't even allow you to call them telenovelas. They want you to call them novelas. But there is a whole industry. They spend a lot of money making this telenovelas, and most of them are literary works that are made into soap operas, and it is a national pastime. They, they are shown normally between 7 p.m. and 10.30 p.m., and everybody watches soap operas, kids, grandparents. If you don't watch the soap opera, you don't have much to talk about the next day at work. So. So, you know, many of these works I mentioned in the previous slide have been, you know, put into TV shows, a TV series, or made its way uh, as movies. I have to make a disclaimer. I have two clips from two of those movies that are probably uh, well known. At but of course they are violent, so I just wanted you to, to know. Pichote is the first movie in Latin American cinema that not only portrays 
homeless kids in the streets, but uh, the director chose to have those kids as the um, as actors, and this created a, a trend in Latin American cinema, and we have from, in different countries directors that go to the streets and then they don't even give the kids or the group of um, street people or homeless people any script. They just record what happens daily and then that becomes a movie. And most of the characters or the actors in the clip I'm going to show uh, from Pichotti, uh died actually, you know, were killed before the movie even came and out and was released. So this is Pichotchi, and um, you know it came out in 1981, and it was based on a novel written, written by Jose Lucero, um, who did um, he was an anthropology and sociology and um, a journalist and based on the work he had done in the streets uh, in Brazil, then he wrote this book. And then we have City of God. Uh, this is probably the most well-known because it was highly publicized and, and it won or was nominated for many awards uh, all over the world. And again, it was also based on a novel re written by Paulo Lins, who was a child who grew up in a favela was able to escape the life in the favela and then became a writer. So those two are examples of um, this tradition of uh, portraying uh, urban violence in Brazil through literature, through movies, and through music. Um, I think, though they do it in a very different way, each one of uh, these movies, Basically, they are proposing what we could call narrative of resistance to the traditional interpretation uh, that says uh, these kids who grew up in the favelas, since they are poor and they don't have any access to education, they won't have access to jobs, uh, the only way out is to become drug dealers in the favelas and that is you know, a life of crime that ends up with them being killed normally. Um, nevertheless, uh, there have been several instances in Brazilian history in which we see uh, these kids not necessarily 
in the context of the favela, for example, there was a well-known massacre on the steps of the main cathedral in the city of Rio de Janeiro, um, in which a group of homeless kids who came to sleep there every night, um, I think only two of them survived of 80 who were sleeping there because there was um, a paramilitary group uh, that had been um, founded um, by the wealthy people in Rio de Janeiro who were cleaning the city. So they would go to gay bars or they would kill homeless kids in order to keep the city safe and clean, as they called it. So um, we see that this idea of a cycle of violence that is the necessary result of being born or growing up in a favela is very problematic and history has shown that it's much more complicated than that. So in the case of the, the novel I'm talking about, we are going to see that one of the issues that it portrays is the fact that these slums or ch chanty towns um, have appeared in, in these mega cities in, in Brazil uh, as a result normally of internal migration. Brazil has struggled throughout history with the fact that most of the population in the country lives around this area, the coastal area, and people uh, move here constantly from the interior or from the north or northeastern part of the country looking for jobs. The poorest area of the country is the northeastern part of the country. This is the area through which the Portuguese first arrived and the slave trade started here in the city of Salvador. So this area happens to be the most Afro-Brazilian area in the country as well. But we have, you know, indigenous people in this area, and here we have um, situations um, of poverty due to um, weather and geographic conditions. It's, you know, this area has had periods of seven years of drought, 10 years of drought, three years of drought. So people tend to move either to uh, Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo, thinking that these are the places where they are going to find jobs. Actually, in order to try to stop that process, um, one president decided to create um, or to move the capital of Brazil from Rio de Janeiro and build the new capital we know nowadays that is the city of Brasilia and it's in the interior part of the country to try to make people move there and have Brasilia as a center of development for, for the country. And please feel free to stop me if you want me to say something or if you have a question about what, what I'm saying. You don't need to wait till the end. So these are the two uh, mega cities in the country, uh, or at least the most well-known. We see the city of Sao Paulo here. With the metropolitan area, we're talking about between 20 to 24 million people living there. And this is the city of Rio de Janeiro. And as you see here, this is Brasilia. And Brasilia was built as this ultra-modern city at the time in the 60s. Uh, and buildings looked like UFOs. It, it, it was designed as, a, as an airplane. It has two wings and, and it's a completely organized city uh, because they were trying to plan it in such a way that it was going to be controlled as opposed to the other cities that have gone chaotically. This is a very famous picture that you can find everywhere. Um, 
in social media. This is in Sao Paulo. So you see here the neighborhood where they have swimming pools in each of the apartments. And you know, there is only this wall, and here is the main favela in the city. So that is um, you know, daily life in Brazil. And this is a favela in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And in Rio de Janeiro, the favelados say they have a better view of the beach than the wealthy people because the favelas are up in the mojos, the hills. So huge social and economic inequalities in, in the country. This is the writer I'm talking about today, Patricia Mello. As I said, she was a journalist, and um, she has written um, scripts for films. And she um, has also written many novels, and they are all um, novels about killers. And as I said, in most of them, um, the killer is speaking in the first person, describing what they are doing. Now, going particularly to the novel I am working on, uh, it is called, uh, it was translated into English as The Killer, O Matador. And what we have is a main character, and as you see the name, you know, uh, in port particularly in Brazilian Portuguese, they have no problem taking words, particularly from English, and making them into Portuguese. So that is Michael, right? The name Michael, Portuguesized or Brazilianized, whatever we want to call it. Right? So he is um, not a child. No, he is in his 20s. Uh, he doesn't live in the favela. He lives in a small town close to the city of Sao Paulo. And he works as a salesman. Um, he, of course, doesn't enjoy his work. The only thing he likes about it is that he can come at night and sneaks in gets into the most expensive cars and goes around the city flirting with women, um, showing off different cars every day. As most of uh, Brazilians, he's passionately um, a follower in Portuguese, it's called torcedor, of the main team in his um, state. And he uh, has a cousin, and they bet uh, for one of the um, soccer games that take place in the city, and he loses the bet. And as a result of that, he has to dye his hair blonde. What happens is that as soon as he sees his new image on, in that mirror, he feels that a major transformation happens for him. He realizes and he lets us know as readers that this is the first time in his life that he's happy about his appearance, that he feels he's strong, he's handsome. He even feels that he has a halo around his uh, head and that he is completely a different person now that he's blonde. And he goes out to the bar where he's supposed to meet his friends. And as soon as he gets there, there is a, a, a criminal from the town uh, in the bar. He's not a, an acquainted of Michael, and he laughs at him because he has his hair uh, blonde. And he tells him, you look ridiculous. You look like a gringo. Michael takes it immediately personally, and he's not offended. And, and this is one of the interesting components in the, in the narrative. He's not offended by the fact that he's not, that his Brazilianness is questioned because apparently now he wants to become an American as opposed to being 
who he was. What he understands is that he is called a deer. In Portuguese, the animal, the deer, is veado. And it is used in slang as a way to uh, mistreat, to disrespect gay men. And we don't know how he makes that connection between gringo and beado. The, the other character never says that word, but that's the word he hears. And as a reaction to that, he invites him to a duel the next day at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. What is interesting in the narrative is that, you know, he goes back to his house, and in that trajectory, he lets us see what he's thinking. And then he says, why am I so stupid? Why did I do that? You know, what am I going to do tomorrow? I don't know him. I could care less about what he says. About he has no clear understanding of why he reacted that way. And he has never, ever owned a gun. He doesn't know how to use a gun. So he feels that he's now in big trouble. Right? From the beginning in the story, he is having um, an intense toothache. And it bothers him a lot, all the time. The next day, he goes to his cousin's house and lets him know that he's going to find this man and that he needs a gun. And somehow he finds one in the house, goes and finds this man, and the man is with his girlfriend, and he invites him to kill each other. And the guy, you know, who is not interested at all in that, never accepted the invitation, laughs at him. And he continues walking and says, if you want to kill me, you're going to have to do it from my back, and that's what he does. You know, he kills him, and um, he runs back home thinking, you know, this is a very stupid thing, what I did. They are going to take me to jail now. I'm going to be a criminal now. And then he realizes that none of that happens. <clears throat> that actually, uh, this first action of killing this man uh, becomes the beginning of a process in which he's going to become the hero of the town. Right? Uh, he's surprised by the fact that after this killing, he finds presence at the door of his house. You know, he's hiding, and when he finally gets the courage to open the door and go out, there, there is... There is even one pig there, a tiny pig, as, as a, and a lot of notes that say, thank you, thank you for killing him. You're cool, you're great, thank you. After that, um, he continues to suffer from the toothache. He goes finally to the dentist in town, and the dentist tells him, I heard you did this. My daughter was raped by this guy. If you kill him, I will do the treatment for free. So he goes home and thinks about it, and then he says, well, this toothache is worth killing a person uh, because it won't bother me anymore. So that is the second one. And then after that, what we see is that not only everyone in town is um, congratulating him for what he's doing, he himself thinks that actually he doesn't kill anyone. He only kills bad people. And he's actually doing a, a favor to everybody in town. And everybody in town is actually telling him clearly that that is the case. Right? That uh, he is offering services that they didn't have. That he's actually keeping the town without these other criminals, and that he is needed in town. So he ends up creating a business, has an office, moves out of the neighborhood to a very wealthy apartment, 
where he has swimming pool and all of, jacuzzi and all of that. And he, um, you know, um, has workers who work for him. All he does is the intelligence work, right? He identifies the person. He identifies daily routine. He identifies when and where they are going to kill him. And he organizes the way this is going to happen. And at the end of the story, he receives, you know, on TV, newspapers, the award of the man of the year. Um, and he's, you know, heavily involved with the politicians there. So the novel, what it does is, as I said from the beginning, uh, offer a more complex view um, on um, criminals and violence in urban settings in Brazil by connecting violence and gender. And we have a series of women uh, to whom he is connected throughout the, the story. Um, he ends up marrying his girlfriend, but then he kills her because she is very jealous, and he ends up living with a lover who was the girlfriend of the first man he killed. Right. And the two of them raised the daughter he had with his wife. But then the other important component is how she emphasizes the connection between violence, social, and historical context. So she's not proposing a general theory, a global theory of violence, but specifically for Brazil and specific social, cultural, economic, political conditions in the country. And um, most importantly, I think the question she raises for us is the question of social participation in these processes of you know, violent actions that take place. Um, so it's not, again, the idea of um, he was born an assassin or he was made an assassin, but how by everybody being part of a cultural context in which corruption is the main component and the state cannot, does not, doesn't want to avoid taking responsibility and protecting its citizens, then you have a person like Michael that comes in and is able to um, do um, the job that ends up uh, perpetuating um, urban violence in, in the city, right? as opposed to uh, taking actions that will allow uh, for change in those processes of violence. So I see that the novel, you know, against the, what we can call the master narrative about criminal minds, she proposes narratives of resistance to that, and more than anything else, questions how the Brazilian state, uh, Brazilian politicians, Brazilian citizens participate in these processes by being part of a corrupt state that is, has been paying a very high price for those situations. So thank you. <laughs>